First Sergeant Kemp here with Company D, Second United States Sharpshooters, and today in the workshop I have an exciting bit of show and tell. Recently I was able to track down uh, an excellent condition original 1859 Sharps cleaning kit. Um, I got it from a, a very reputable and uh, very experienced military collector and dealer, and um, I wanted to share it with you today. As well as towards the end, uh, we'll get into the nuts and bolts into some pretty uh, exact measurements of what I have. So if you want to try making your own, I whenever I uh, whenever I recreate this stuff, I, I post um, sort of my detailed process and my notes on our website at secondusss.com. So be sure to check it out. Uh, most of this sort of stuff is going to be listed under our armory page, uh, but if you don't see it, be sure to uh, search what you're looking for in the search bar and you'll find your article uh, a little bit faster that way. So what do we have to share today? Well, we have the Garrison Rod, which is uh, a 30 inch uh, dowel with a uh, brass ferrule on the end, and you can see right there, uh, it has a small pin holding it on. Uh, these have a, a unique thread pitch. Uh, I believe, let me check my notes, I think it was like quarter, yeah, I believe it's like a quarter 24. Um, it's, not a, it's, a, it's not a common pitch, but if you were to try to make it dead on exactly, you can still get those taps and dies. Um, and uh, some research uh, seems to think that these were generally made out of hickory. Um, it's hard to tell after all these years, but um, due to its density, uh, I'm willing to believe that these probably would have been hickory. Uh, finding, hick finding hickory dowels um, in about 7 16ths can be a bit of a challenge, um, but I'm sure if you're willing to try, uh, you, you, should be able to, you might be able to find one, or if you're really clever, make your own. Uh, this was uh, a copy that I made last week, and I used pine, and I feel like the two look uh, pretty similar. And granted that you know this one's a week old, and this one's 150 years old, so that's it. Now the garrison rod. So let's talk about um, where these would have been. Um, these would not have been in the soldier's knapsack. Um, I believe uh, when the Sharps manu Manufacturing Company packaged 10 Sharps rifles to a crate, there would have been one cleaning rod for every 10 rifles. I do believe that I did see a reference that said there might have been two. So either way, uh, they're sharing this. And generally the name implies that this would have been in a stationary camp uh, or garrison. Uh, so, yeah, these definitely aren't everyday carry items for the uh, sharpshooters or a person using an 1859 sharps during the war, but these did exist. The other thing to uh, kind of bring up is there's, when we get into the research, there's a lot that's not known for sure uh, based on available uh, information and um, what little consistency there seems to be. We can, we can draw some pretty reasonable conclusions. But a lot of um, highly respected research, and we'll get into some of that here in a little bit, um, there's a lot of could be, uh, seems like, and um, so there's still a lot of, um, a lot of leeway in research. Uh, there doesn't seem to be much documented uh, or written about uh, sharpshooters cleaning their, their weapons. Um, I know uh, Wyman White uh, only wrote about, uh, I think, two instances of cleaning his rifle. Um, one later in the war when he was doing a lot of uh, solo target rifle work, he would write about coming in every three days or so uh, to make new bullets and thoroughly clean his rifle. And then he also wrote about um, scavenging some uh, good fabric off the body of a, a dead Confederate officer for cleaning his rifle. Um, and then I believe uh, Matthews of Company D only wrote about rifle care once. And that was during uh, uh, an, an inspection in which uh, Berdan was so disgusted at the sorry, dirty state of their rifles that he actually threatened to take them away. So uh, that's kind of all we have to go on. And when I got into the hobby, I was always really curious, like, well, how do they clean you know, their, their weapons in the field? So we'll kind of get into that a little bit. But here is the garrison rod. And then we have the 
pull through, this is a uh, single thong pull through cleaner with a removable brush. Again, this is uh, a quarter 24 thread, I believe. And um, there's, there's still, there's a little bit of debate or uncertainty as to um, which thong cleaner was used for what rifle. Um, some research uh, seems to think that um, the double thong pull through cleaner was used for the rifle. Another research um, seems to imply that the double thong was for the carbine. And so what I mean by double thong is that um, instead of having one uh, piece of leather and the brush on the end, you would have the double thong in which the brush was in the middle and you would have a thong on either side. It was quite clever. So that way you can start the brush and you can pull it back and forth through the rifle um, and, and quickly clean your bore. However, uh, when I was talking to a, uh, an, a collector, uh, he, his reasoning, and it kind of goes along with some other research, was that the single pull-through cleaner was, um, since it was removable, because the double thong was um, pinned into place, you could not remove the brush off the double thong cleaner. The single thong, as you can see, is removable. And the reason why this brush and this cleaning system is removable was so that it could interchange and be used on the garrison rod. And so this has me personally convinced that this would have been more likely uh, used for the rifle rather than the carbine. However, that said, that doesn't mean it was exclusive to one or the other because both types were, were floating out there. And if they needed a, a, a way to clean a sharps rifle, I think all possibilities were open and available. Since uh, only the, I believe only the sharps and the Spencer um, didn't have a cleaning rod as far as uh, breech loaders. And um, so you'll also see these uh, cleaning systems referenced for the Spencer rifle as well. And then as with, I, I would say military tradition, uh, after the war, a lot of this stuff was kept into inventory and um, I guess also used on some early trapdoor rifles. So these, these stayed in service for a little bit. Um, and so you can find them referenced in different areas, but you can see already that it makes uh, research uh, a bit of a, a hurdle. Um, <clears throat> so where am I getting a lot of my research? Well, I've done a lot online, um, different um, books on the Sharps rifle. Uh, and then, you know, when I've worked with uh, military collectors and relying on their expertise. But uh, I've written about this book on our website, uh, Gun Tools, their, their History and Identification. This is kind of a hard book to find. Um, it's not impossible, um, but it is also kind of a, a pretty expensive book. Uh, but it's worth it if you're really into this sort of thing. It, I mean, it has just hundreds of pages about the history of gun tools. So if you want to know what rifle used what, what manufacturer did this, um, then you can find that out. And it's got a lot of really great pictures. And unlike a lot of books, this one actually is pretty good about talking about materials and actual measurements, um, which I, as a maker, I find that very, very helpful. Um, and on 284, they have, uh, they, they start their section on the, the pull-through cleaning system. Uh, some varieties that are known um, in different exhibits, uh, style changes, diameter changes. Um, essentially what they say here for uh, these cleaning brushes um, is suffice it to say they will all clean carbines from 50 caliber to 56 with thongs attached. The sets range from 29 inches to 39 and a half. Again, this may or may not indicate simple manufacturing subcontractor variations. So there, again, so that, that's a perfect example. These people have done tons of research, they've had their hands on tons of examples, but there's not a lot known. There's not a whole lot of um, paper trail saying, you know, these people made these products under these specifications and they went to these people. We don't really know any of that information. Um, the 
So yeah, and then it talks about cleaning rods, uh, detachable and non-detachable versions, um, the wiping rod. Yeah, and then they 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 altered them um, apparently uh, for 1873, and those are supposed to be very very rare. And then they have a uh, about a page and a half going about going into the the changing of the cleaning rods. So. Um, again, if you want to learn more about this, um, there's good information in here, and there's also a section on the 1859 Sharps tool, which is also very rare. Most of the time you type in uh, Sharps tool on the internet or on eBay, you're going to get the cartridge conversion one, which is essentially just a set of screwdrivers. Um, and they have a couple examples in here of what they would have looked like. I think that might be on my maker to-do list. So. What's so cool about these cleaning kits? Well, one, these things, the ones I bought are practically new old stock. Uh, they're in impeccable shape and they don't look like they've ever been used. But first, let's take a peek at this uh, brush here. So this is the standard 54 caliber uh, bore brush that you can get at any sporting goods store. That is what I keep in my implement pouch. Standard size. Civil War size. Look at how big. This, this thing is twice as long and it is just a beast of a brush. It is, this is the, this is the thing that shocked me was just how big this was. Um, this length varied quite a bit. So obviously, you know, these new ones that we bought, uh, they're brass, but the originals were boar hair, uh, just like in your uh, toothbrush for reenacting. And they came in different styles. No one knows who made what or why they chose different colors, uh, but they had the black boar hair as well as the uh, white or pale uh, boar hair, more like a toothbrush. And um, it is a big brush. You can see, you know, I mean, this one, uh, let's see if I can get it in there. It's got some long hairs, some that didn't, that missed being trimmed. So it's really kind of, it's a really nice little bit of history on there. Um, and I've ran it through my bore, it wasn't dirty, um, but this thing fits beautifully and it flexes so nicely. Um, I'm very impressed with the quality and how well these uh, brushes work. Um, the rest of it is assembled pretty much just like any other cleaning brush that we're familiar with today. Um, I'm going to be experimenting with trying to recreate uh, these essentially oversized cleaning brushes. The, um, they're pretty close to like a, a modern, like nylon, like bottle brush. You, you can get it at like a hardware store, you get those brush cleaning kits. Granted, they didn't have nylon, but it looks pretty close. So if we're going to fudge it that way. Uh, and I've done some research. Apparently, I, from what I can find vaguely on the internet, there is like a Chinese company that makes natural hair, um, gun brushes. Um, I don't know anyone who, deals in them, but I have seen images and they all seem to link back to the same Chinese manufacturing plant. So um, I don't know about that, but I do know that there, there could be a possibility you could track down something out of natural material that you could do. Um, or if you're a fan of tedium, you could probably twist this wire yourself and make your own, but uh, that's uh, way beyond my patience level. So there's this, and then we have the, the cleaning thong. Again, the length varied uh, quite a bit. Generally, the shorter ones are gonna be for the carbines. And then you have a brass ferrule that is pinned into place and it has your thread inside. Now, one thing that the uh, book does know for certain, as you can see, hopefully, and I'll, uh, I'll get this in close as we go over exact measurements, you can see the end of this uh, 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 wiping rod has a crown on it. And these crowned rods are distinctively Civil War era issue. Um, so it, it makes for a nice, um, you know, finished product. It seems like it's you know, a little more high quality than uh, some of the later models that are just, you know, straight cut brass stock. So um, I will say... Um, there's probably no way in the world we're going to pick this up. But um, if you look down in here, you can see 
what looks like a lathe center. And so that probably means this, this whole thing would have been turned on a lathe. Um, and then uh, have a, a shoulder turned down. This would be counterboard. Um, and then you would uh, tap it for the thread for your brush and then pinned on into place. Uh, this rod is roughly 7 16 It's a little bit bigger. You can see, yeah, I mean, it's just a skosh. I mean, that could just be, you know, age of, you know, oil absorption. So I would say this is about the 7 16 And uh, there we go. And there's, the, there's the, the new one that I made right next to it. So it looks pretty close. So let's go ahead and um, get you in and I'll uh, provide you um, some measurements off my caliper and um, we'll go from there. So let's start by taking a deep dive into the pull through cleaner. We have a cleaner that is 35 inches over all length and then it is topped with a three quarter inch long brass ferrule. And this here is roughly sixteenths of an inch pin that goes through here. And uh, it's about 11 sixty-fourths from the edge to uh, the center of the pin. Um, I use four millimeter leather lace. And it's pretty much dead on the same size, but let's throw some measurements up here for you. Granted, this is natural material, so there's going to be some variance. So that's actual dimension. And then I have the one that I make. And this way you can kind of get up close and see how close the 4 mil is to the original. Then, coming down here, we have our threaded area, which I figure is about a quarter 24. You can see there's a slight recess right there, and you can see maybe the uh, thong coming through roughly halfway in, which is held in by that pin. Now, the stock that they used is a little little bit bigger than a quarter of an inch. So that's how big of a stock they're using. Now, I use quarter inch when I re when I remake mine and you can see the quarter inch is just the teensiest little bit too small. So if you were to make were to make it dead on exact, you would uh you would need to have a a machinist lathe to get that little bit, but it's not that big of a, a difference for me. So there is the thong. Let's take a look at the brush here. Let's see the natural fibers. One thing, let's see if it'll show up in the camera. Maybe it, maybe that's it, right? There appears to be a brass pin that doesn't come out the other side. So I'm wondering if this is sort of like a, a steep angle pin that's driven through the brush and then this is pressed into place. That's kind of what I'm thinking. So we can maybe get a rough measurement of the width of it and then the length it's about it's about five inches um just a little bit shy of five inches the stock right there Just like that. Now, when I make mine, like I said, I use four millimeter leather lace followed by quarter inch uh, brass. And when I uh, do this in my home shop, I just have a, a wood lathe 
And so what I'll do is I have two Jacob's Chucks. So I have a Jacob Chuck in the head and tail stock. And so on the uh, headstock, I will secure my piece. And then the tail stock, I'll put in my drill bit. And um, just like the original, I uh, drill my hole all the way through. And then I tap all the way through. And then for mine, I'll actually add a little bit of epoxy onto the end of the lace. And then I just like twist it on. And then the depth on my recreation is determined by the brush, by the, the length of the tool. And so without measuring, I'll just put my brush in, twist it till it stops, take the tool out, and then I'll let it dry. And then I'll put my rivet in. And this I just use on mine. I'll use a nail. I'll cut the ends off. I'll paint it over and then clean it up with a final and then uh, buff everything out when I'm done. On mine, I use, um, I'll drill with a 532nd bit and then I'll tap 1032 because that is one of the most common sizes for black powder cleaning tools. So that way I can put my brass brush on, which is in my implement pouch, but I can also put on a patch puller, which these were not in the Civil War. Um, and they weren't carried by soldiers. You would have had uh, like a worm or something. Um, definitely wouldn't have these modern, I think, Thompson Center ones uh, in a, on any soldier's kit. Uh, but I do like the convenience of this. And uh, I'll also sometimes keep a mop, uh, a bore mop, uh, for cleaning it out. I will say these things are incredibly convenient because they take up almost no space in your implement pouch. Um, but they, they are very messy to use, especially after a long day of reenacting. And uh, you'll, your hands get a lot dirtier than you would with a, with a modern cleaning rod. But the convenience is fantastic. Okay, let's go ahead and take a peek at this garrison rod. So we have a 7 16 dowel. Uh, probably hickory and then we have a one inch long brass ferrule again with a pin securing everything into place figure this one's about 330 seconds and 730 seconds up from the base um, for this uh, when I remake it I use 7 16 brass stock and it's pretty close but the original so if we can get a caliper on there you can see where and then we have our crown which is about a, a one eighth inch radius and then we have our portion where we put our tool into our brush into <clears throat> and and so the depth here is gosh let's see if i can remember let's just take a peek So that's that's the depth of the threads until it hits the the dowel uh, from the brush from the tool side, and then this is of course going to be counterboard to accommodate the the shoulder or the tenon of the rod itself. Uh, but without taking it apart, I can't tell precisely what that counterbore is going to be. So I want to preserve that. So what I did for mine is I cut my brass stock to length. And again, with two Jacob's chucks on my wood lathe, I uh, bored all the way through uh, 5 30 seconds. Um, and then I counter bored on the dowel side 3 eighths of an inch 
diameter five eighths of an inch in and that that is based solely on the use of implements that I use and then once that was done I uh, just took a hand file and with the lathe on I just hand filed my radius on and then I went ahead and tapped 1032 and then I put a little bit of epoxy on and slid it onto the dowel. Now the dowel, I used a marking gauge to run my, uh, to score a line all the way around. And with that 3 8 bore, all I had to do was just take a, a carving knife and cut just like the tiniest little bit of wood off. And this ferrule just slipped right on, I let the epoxy dry. And then I put in another nail, peened it, and cleaned it all up on the buffing wheel. And that's, that's what I got. Well, I hope our look into the obscure 1859 Sharps cleaning system has been informational. Uh, if you would like to find more research, be sure to check out this book. It has lots of great detail information and many, many, many quality pictures uh, to help answer your questions about identifying gun tools. Um, if you have any questions, uh, be sure to let us know down in the comments below and we'll, we'll try to answer them. Thanks as always for subscribing. Um, and if you would like a little bit more information about how I go about recreating these, uh, be sure to check out our website at secondusss.com. And I also um, have some good close-up photos of different measurements and stuff like that when I come across originals so that way our whole community can benefit from our shared research. As always, thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.